Hello, everybody. I'm Zenith Rule, and welcome back to the Disney Debate, where Kat Mack and I talk about Disney products and Disney in general. So, how's it going today, Kat? Uh, it is going very well, uh, because I have watched a film that got me out of that funk that's so dear to my heart had caused. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, we we went from one of the worst films in Disney history to something very enjoyable, I have to say. Um, Because the film that we're going to talk about today, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, is one of the best package films that Disney ever released. Um, We've talked about a lot of the package films in Disney history. Most of them came out in the 1940s. However, with um, with the Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, it's it works so much better than everything we've seen up until this point, with the exception of Fantasia. Fantasia is really not something I look at as a package film because it has so much of a different direction about it. But this, everything just works about it, you know. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that uh, both The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad were originally supposed to be separate movies on their own. Because mm-hmm. from what I've read, um, the story of Mr. Toad was supposed to be The Wind in the Willows. Because Disney had read the, read the book, and he wanted to do his own animated full-length feature of it. Unfortunately, um, they had only gotten about half an hour of animation done completed by the time the war had started and as we all know by then they had lost half their animation team and their resources so which which is why they had to do these package films and although disney tried to keep wind in the willows as a full-length feature film uh he came to the sad conclusion that there just wasn't enough money to make it possible so Mm -hmm. hence why he just decided to focus on the story of mr toad and then make it a package film with another. And and one thing that's really interesting about this is, first of all, this is the last Disney package film, the, the seventh and the last one until The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, which came out in 1977, and that just is a collection of stories about one character. Mm-hmm. And this is the only one that really it has story direction – and the only package film that I can think of that is based off of real books, and that's something that Disney excels at. He excels at making movies. He excels at making books into really well done animated features. And you know, looking at the list, we have Fantasia, which was an original Disney creation, and it was an experience. It was something very different. We have Saludos Amigos, which really wasn't based on anything. It was just kind of a culture romp. Um, Three Caballeros was Saludos Amigos done right, but it wasn't based on anything. And there were some weird things about it. It really sacrificed a lot of story. Mm -hmm. Um, Make Mine Music is just a collection of animated shorts, but they're not really based on anything. And Fun and Fancy Free and Melody Time were based on existing tales somewhat but well fun and fancy free half of it was based on existing fairy tales i don't know about that bears slapping each other one mm. <laughs> and um yeah bears bears <laughs> time for a game of disappearing bears um and then with melody time it was just basically make my music only a few more numbers in there and some some things like Pecos Bill and Johnny Appleseed were real life legends, but those were only a small part of the package. It, a lot of these were not really well focused endeavors, and when you think about it, the only one that really featured two two animated shorts didn't work because it was mostly padded and it didn't do the original concept justice. But when you're talking about the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad, it has two two animated features. They're both based on existing books that Disney knows about and cares about, and they have 
they have the advantage of being at the end of the 1940s. This is 1949, and for a lot of these package films, he didn't have the money or the time to get in the animators and the budget and whatnot. But with this one, you can tell that the animation is so much better than all these other features that came before it. Yeah, yeah, the animation is definitely definitely a lot better than the previous package films. I mean, the character is still kind of goofy, really cartoony looking, but it, it has much more of a structure to it. And, uh, and, and you can see that a lot more planning was put into the design of these characters, into the, the lighting and... And, and just the appearance of everything on screen. For example, in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, there's a huge scene where the Headless Horseman attacks and everything, like, the colors change to really dark tones and everything's accentuated. And even though it's kind of... It's not, like, superbly animated, it makes up for it by being, like, really well stage very well lit the the mood is really well put across you know mm-hmm. and the, the they and the way that they kind of you know they mix up cause they make both uh human characters and anthropomorphic characters as well as a few uh you know generally animal characters as well but you know that they're, they're not too like whereas i i guess the way to describe it like is a uh, that horrendous animation in uh, So Dear to My Heart, where you had the uh, the animal characters look so goofy, and then you had the human characters look like too realistic to act to sort of, like you know look like actual cartoons. Mm-hmm. In this case, like they both ha- have that same flow to it, you know, so n- neither one is distracting the other. And it feels natural, you know, the animation feels natural to both of these animated features. And one thing that really sets this apart from, you know, everything other than Fantasia is that everything flows well together. They, they, first of all, they're both told as storybooks. You go, you start off in a library and there's, there's a voice narrating the books to you and saying, oh, this is one of my favorite stories. And then after we finish The Wind in the Willows, it transitions to another book where another author is, you know, saying, well, you know, Mr. Toad is a great character, but here's one from America. This is one that we really enjoy. And so it, they all have a very similar tone in the way the stories are being told. Right, because it's not like in uh, Make My Music where they, you know, slap a bunch of uh, a bunch of cartoons that are about music with a bunch of cartoons that are just, you know, cartoons, you know. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, like Fun and Fancy Free, where you have, you know, where you have uh, two stories that have nothing to do with each other, and then a really weird and awkward transition in the middle. And, you know, narrators that are completely and utterly worthless in the long run. <laughs> and it, it makes sense here to have a narrator. Um, I mean, you have this person who's introducing us to the book, he's in a library, and he's he's reading it to someone. We don't see who he's reading it to. But there's an essence of okay, this is a this is a story, and this is it being told in a different format. However, I wasn't too fond of the narration in the Wind in the Willows per se because the way it's done, it's a little bit different than the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, where it, it keeps intercutting between the characters actually talking and the actual narration of the dialogue in the book, and so you have this. Like, at random points at times, this narrator pops in and speaks for the characters instead of the characters actually talking some more. And I, you know, I know Cat liked this a lot better than I do, but the thing is, it, to me, it says, okay, we didn't have enough money to, you know, have the voice actors say all their lines. And it doesn't feel natural. It, I can see if it was all narrated or mostly narrated. But it just seems like at random points in times, the narrator pops in and says, okay, let's move the story along, you know, kind of rush through things a little bit. I I think a big reason is that they wanted to incorporate a lot of the original dialogue from the book into the movie, which they have. But having the characters themselves actually say it, like certain uh, 
you know, certain uh, sentences and all that. It doesn't, like, really feel natural to their character, hence why they probably had the narrator do it instead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's one of those books that's a little bit older. It was, it was made in a time where they they wrote and spoke quite a lot differently than today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially especially Wind in the Willows, since it's, a, since it's an old, uh, really old uh, English story. And, and so it, it's it's a bit distracting for me, but overall, I'd still say it's a very good adaptation of the story. I say it's very fun, all the characters are very lively, and it's it works as a format. I mean, I never, personally, I never read The Wind in the Willows, so I don't know everything that goes on it on within it, but I did hear summaries from people who have read it. And from what I gathered, um, The Adventures of Mr. Toad is really close to how the book was. I think the only thing they changed was that they tried to make uh, Mr. Toad a little more likable and sympathetic. Because in the, in the cartoon, he is a cute... He develops an obsession with trying to get a motor car. You know, he's a thrill seeker. And he's then accused of having stolen a motor car, but then it turns out later that he was framed and then gets name cleared. In the mm-hmm. book, he actually does steal the car and is and is thrown in prison for it. And that, and then actually later on, when he after he escapes from prison, he ends up Stealing the same exact car again and crashes it. it. It's a bit of a different story. Like I, I, I read The Wind in the Willows when maybe I was like five or so. Like it was, I was very young, so I don't remember too, too much about it. But I have to say that the the story of Mister Toad really works in this. It's a little bit rushed, you can say, because you know the book was very much longer than the cartoon is. But, um, you know, I, I still say it works for what it is. Um, let, do you want to go by characters now? Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll start with uh, Mr. Toad first, then go to, uh, then go to Ichabod. So. Well, there are other characters in The Wind in the Willows, too. I know. As I said, we start with, the, uh, with Mr. Toad and then go to the next one. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, M- Mr. Toad... His character is very eccentric, and for the most part, he is the the lifeblood of this film, because it's his problem that causes all the events, and it's his mania that really makes you laugh. It's he's a very humorous character. Mm-hmm. Very much. He he's basically the epitome of a person who was born into wealth, and will do and will use that well to do the most insane insane shit possible, you know, just for the thrill of it. He mm-hmm. basically embodies everyone, you know, everyone who if they suddenly got a huge amount of money, like what they would do on it. I mean, I know if I personally got like a hundred thousand dollars or something, I'd definitely like buy the fastest car or something, just drive clear across the country, which is kind of what he does. Like the the only downside is that he he's like I said he's a thrill seeker and the problem with thrill seekers is that they get a rush out of new and exciting things but then it burns out really quick afterwards. Mhm. And we see him we see him with his mania of you know he has this horse and buggy and he he's driving around the countryside banging into everything causing all kinds of property damage. And then he sees a motor car, and he's like, oh, I have to have this, this motor car. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the funny thing about this is he doesn't, like, really go out and say it. He His eyes, like, turn all trippy and spirally, and he starts puttering, and he, he starts, like, hopping up and down on his butt. And he, he's just like... <laughs> I'm just like this guy. He, he's so hilarious. Yeah, he kind of like goes into like a trance or something where he just imagining with just imagining himself, you know, in the thrill of driving a motor car. It's like uh, it's like almost like you. It's like a drug to him where you know he needs it to get that rush, that feeling, and like nothing else matters. 
Mm -hmm. (laughs) And unfortunately, like a drug habit, his actions have a lot of negative repercussions to them. Because not only does he spend pretty much all his money on every new fad and exciting thing that he can find, but he also causes property damage with it to a lot of people and places, and this has caused him to go into debt. But... Again, because, you know, he's so obsessed with finding the next new exciting thing, none of this matters to him. However, this does matter to another to another uh, character, our next character, uh, uh, McBadger. Mm-hmm. Mc, McBadger is basically the keeper of his estate, and he's going crazy because, you know, he, his, his ward is doing all kinds of crazy things. He has to pay for all the damages that Mr. Toad causes, and he causes a lot of damages, especially at the end of the film when he gets the mania of, you know, driving an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, he he he's like, he's people keep knocking on his door and he can't get any work done because people keep knocking on his door and he can't, you know, he can't pay for all these damages himself. It's he, Mr. Toad is kind of a dick. Yeah, that's... That's the, that's the weird thing about Mr. Toad. He definitely is an asshole in the fact that, you know, he's basically a spoiled little rich boy who wastes money without a second thought. But at the same time, he's so much fun to watch. Like, you can't help but like him. Because he's kind of like the person you want to be. You know, just you mm-hmm. know, with all the money in the world and nowhere in particular to go. Except for the fun of it. But but you know he 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 does kind of stupid things with his money. First of all, in this in this version of the Wind in the Willows, um, he trades his manor, his entire manor, for a single motor car. Right, and the price of the of uh, the manor, his home to call, is a hundred thousand pounds, which you know compared to a motor car, I'm sure is much much. Much, much less. <laughs> so, and, and of course, this is so hard to believe that when he went, went to the court, they refused to believe that he had actually, you know, auctioned off his home for something as trivial as that. But, and understandably so. It's just like, you know, I can understand he has this mania. I can understand Mr. Toad is just like, I gotta have it. But with all that money, just buy the damn motor car. Well, he, in all fairness, because of his, you know, because of his squandering of his money on stupid little things that he was interested in and all the damage he accumulates, he, uh, McBadger d- does end up cutting him off, you know, because he does get, like, an allowance, which, of course, he wastes right away. Mm-hmm. So, he, he wastes on the next big thing, like a, a talking horse or, you know. <laughs> exactly. So, of course, you know, when he do, when they try to put him under house arrest to stop him from getting a motor car, he sneaks out, tries to barter with the first, tries to barter the first motor car he sees with whoever happens to be nearby. You know, not bothered to find out if that is actually their car or not. And you know, again, having no money on him and not being allowed any money from the person running his estate, he just you know does whatever. He's like, oh, I'll give you whatever. I'll give you my house. Just give me the motor car. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he he's not the smartest of people, but you know he, you you got to really enjoy watching him do these crazy things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then there's also his uh, his two friends, his other two friends, which is uh, Ratty mm-hmm. and Mole. And and the thing about it is like Rat is is this incredibly stuffy British, like he looks like Sherlock Holmes, gentleman. And Molly is this incredibly like timid, just young mole man. You know, he he's really he, he's a really he's really gentle. He's really naive. You know, he wants to make you know do everything he can for his friends. He's like his loyalty is you know undeniable, but it's to the point where you know he's way too soft for his own good. You know, way too you know. Unassuming. Mm-hmm. And he he has a little bit too much of a fondness for Mr. Toad, if you catch my drift. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, waving to him from across the room, clapping when he makes a speech. 
you know, just giving this cute little smile whenever he can. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I know it's bad to insinuate, but that's that's the kind of uh, vibe I get from him. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, it's not offensive. It's not even it's not even really implied at, at any point. It's it's not like the reluctant dragon, which I will continue to bring up. <laughs> I will continue to bring it up, um, but it's not like the Reluctant Dragon where it flat out, like, says something. <laughs> you know. Exactly. <laughs> and, they, and then the, the last characters are the villain, which is, uh, which is uh, this one barkeep named Mr. Winky who has, a, who has a, the craziest mustache. He, he has the, the craziest hair I've ever seen on a cartoon character. He has the most villainous twirly mustache that I've ever seen, and even his hair on his head is twirlable. <laughs> he twirls them both and during has, the entire film, and no one suspects him of being evil. Yeah, and he has this constant shitting grin on his face. <laughs> that, you know, he just likes, wherever he goes, he just has that weird smile. <laughs> And then he has a henchman, which kind of, kind of, you know, stereotypical, in my opinion, are the weasels, you know. And of course, in almost every film you've ever heard of, the weasels are the bad guys. Yeah, I mean, the the, the weasels, you you can understand from um, a cartoon perspective, you know, weasels, obvious answer for an evil villain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they 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 travel in packs. They're not that smart. And then Winky is organizing them together, and they just wreak havoc in the manor. Right. And they are dastardly. They they have like w- when we see them fighting, they bring knives and pitchforks and torches and everything from Done. every which way from <laughs> nowhere. And uh, for those of you wondering, yes, these are where the weasels from Who Framed Roger Rabbit came from. And they mm-hmm. and they are just about as evil and dastardly and violent as their predecessors. <laughs> so, so th- this film overall, like the characters themselves, aren't that fleshed out. You know, the the main character, Mister Toad, is the one we focus on for the most part, and we see a lot of why he does what he does, but. Rat and Molly don't do much in the film besides, you know, they try to say that Mr. Toad is innocent and they, you know, they get stopped because the the weasels are dastardly and they manipulate the court and Mr. Winky doesn't uh, testify correctly. He lies on the stand and says, oh, this guy stole the stole the carriage and whatnot. Um, But really, the the only character that is super fleshed out in this in this movie is Mr. Toad. Mm-hmm. But even even then he he does he kind of goes through a character arc, but at the same time he doesn't learn anything. Cause like we said, he you know, he tries to get a motor car, he's accused of stealing one, um, he's wrongfully imprisoned for stealing one, and at that point he's He's thinking that, oh, maybe maybe I shouldn't, you know, go crazy for every new thing that comes out since it causes such trouble for myself and my friends. And it seems like he's going to change, but then he's broken out of prison. And in order to escape, he steals a train. Yeah, I was just like, <laughs> okay, you didn't steal the car. That's obvious. But right. even yeah. if you get acquitted for the theft of the car... You just stole a train. That's even worse. And not to mention, you know, ran from the cops and everything. And, 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 then, and, and then they go through that plan where they learn that that a Winky does have the deed to Toad Hall. And they go through this, this whole big thing trying to get it back. And, you know, he's acquitted with no extra charges, surprisingly. And, you know, he swears to, you know modify his ways and everything and be a better better person and all that and his friends believe him and then at the end he ends up buying an airplane and gallivants around the city once again destroying property <laughs> but like we said he learns nothing 
but at the same time, I it isn't really a moral story. It's just basically a story about this really intriguing character. And I don't think he really had to learn anything because he was the way he was. He was a victim of bad circumstance. And, you know, it's just he has this very interesting personality. Yeah. He is very enjoyable. He is the highlight of the film where we have a bunch of these characters who are either one note or don't do much in the grand scheme of things. Even the villain, Winky, doesn't do much. Um, True. But, you know, for the most part, everyone's enjoyable in the film. The climax of the film where they have to steal back the deed to the, the manor and they fight off hundreds of weasels with, like, axes and knives and stuff like that. It, it was it was ludicrous in the good way where, like, anything can happen. It's it's like a good cartoon film, and I thought it was very enjoyable. <laughs> Definitely. Of course, there are some things wrong with it, you know, a few things that make me raise my eyebrow. Like the fact that Toad, Ratty, Mole, McBadger, and the Weasels, they're all clearly anthropomorphic creatures. But then you have characters like Winky, and then every other character that shows up, like the judge, the prosecutor, and all the other onlookers, that are human. And there's also the plot hole of when, right after Mr. Toad escaped from jail... The, the, they see a light on in the Toad Manor, and that's when they learn that, oh, hey, the, the weasels are taking up residence there. If Mr. Toad just escaped from jail, and there are lights on in his manor, why would you not go look for him in the manor? Like, why wouldn't the police not show up and see, oh, well, there there's weasels here. Winky clearly lied. Well, doy. Exactly. And, and not only that, but... Even when um, McBadger learns this fact, in, instead of, you know, their first their first act is go to the police, they, no, they decide that they're going to go get the deed. And that makes no sense. Like, why don't you go to the police, you know, tell them, hey, there's a bunch of squatters hanging out at Toad Hall. Because, you know, Mr. Toad may be in prison, but he still does own Toad Hall. And, you know, McBadger clearly is the person, you know, house-sitting for him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, have the police come, and once he's there, he'll see that, hey, that guy has the deed. Mr. Toad was telling the truth the whole time. You know, reopen his case, you know, acquit him of his crime. But no, they just decide, hey, let's make this harder on ourselves and put ourselves in mortal danger by, you know, facing weasels with armed weapons to get back a piece of paper. But, you know, if they didn't do that, if they if we hadn't had that plot hole, we wouldn't have this amazing climax where we have really good animation, weasels fighting everyone else, and Mr. Toad randomly flying paper airplanes <laughs> down to distract people. I will give it that. The, the climax really does make up for that loophole, the fact that it is really, you know, an exciting scene to watch. And definitely the most exciting scene in all the package films so far. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, overall, The Wind in the Willows itself is a very, very good short, mm -hmm. and it definitely takes up the first half of the film. There's no padding, really, um, and Mr. Toad himself is a great character. And there are some funny jokes. Uh, one character we forgot to mention was uh, the horse, Cyril. He's mm -hmm. Toad's partner in crime. And he does actually make a really funny joke when the prosecutor is bearing down on him. Now keep in mind, the prosecutor in this case is a real dick. Like, he questioned Ratty and Moley and McBadger, barely let them get a word in edgewise before he just completely cut them off. And then he's trying to do the same to the horse, and then he's like, so how did he get the motor car? And the horse is like, the only way that any gentleman gets one, the honest way. And the guy's like, so what is the honest way? And he's like, oh, I thought you would ask that question, Governor. <laughs> 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 so definitely this 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 uh, short is definitely full of wit and humor, and I, I I totally love it. Yeah, I highly recommend this. Um, out of you know of all the animated shorts and the package films, this one has um, the most substance. This you know this is an actual portion from a book. And even as, like, a part of a book, this individual, like, chapter in the book really works on its own 
much more than anything else that we've seen in any of the other package films. Yeah, no doubt. I think by this point they had learned their lesson with trying to make, you know, a bunch of meaningless, frivolous cartoons that had nothing to do with each other, just try to, like, string them together into, like, a movie. It just took two things that were supposed to be movies on their own and just try to, you know, try to connect them in a way that, you know, they that was still, they were still their own films, but at the same time they had something in common that was that gave them a reason to be together as a package. Mm-hmm. And then we have uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which is also very, very good. Um, it's a bit different in that this is mostly narrated. Um, we get, like, the... And we have this omniscient narrator who's, like, showcasing everything that, that's going on. And aside from, like, a couple different parts, the narrator is the one doing most of the talking. Um, there's also, it's also moved forward a lot by song, which is something you don't see in a lot of these package films, Mm -hmm. where we have, like, a lot of, a lot of singing interludes, um, we also have a part in the very end where, um, one of the characters sings the first ever Disney villain song of the, of, ever, Mm -hmm. and so we're gonna get to that again in a bit, but a lot of this is, okay, it's move is it's a cartoon told mostly by narration and song, which kind of puts it a little bit like Fantasia, but it's not trying to do what Fantasia is trying to do. It's, it's, it's a more stylistic approach to a cartoon, and I, I thought it really worked. Yes, and the narrator has the godlike voice of Bing Crosby. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And they would make women everywhere wet their panties and we see that in the cartoon, mm-hmm. <laughs> because the, the the voice of Bing Crosby is also the voice of Ichabod himself. Mm-hmm. Which kind of like makes up for why they try to make Ichabod like a ladies' man in this version, because as said in both the the story and the and the short, Ichabod is really a, an odd looking man. He's very tall. He's very scrawny and like lanky and all that, and his ears are really big. His nose is even bigger. His head is yeah. kind of flat. His feet are as big as shovels. And he's just a really odd-looking individual. Like he, he also has a ponytail that could rival even Nash. <laughs> yes. So, basically, he's a really odd-looking person. You know, not in the least bit attractive. But he ends up becoming a really big ladies' man in this because he has the voice of Bing Crosby. And, you know, he's good at singing, he's good at dancing, he's good at eating other people's cooking, you know, he, he, he's good at, he has a, he's a man of many talents, and he's a very learned man, and, you know, a lot of what this cartoon is showing in, in one sense is that this is the first really intellectual hero that Disney has had. Very true, because not only is he a schoolmaster in the fact that he's also very book smart, but he's also really ambitious and really opportunistic. Plus, he's very damn lucky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, <laughs> for instance, um, he doesn't really punish any of the kids that he teaches in class. And his reason for this is because he wants to stay on his, on his students' good side, so that way he'll be invited over to their uh, parents' house and they can serve him dinner. Because... I assume that, because, like, in the book, he's a very poor person. He can't really afford his own cooking and all that. In fact, they even show him pretty much living in the schoolhouse. But by inviting him, pretty much getting himself invited over to his students' uh, houses, he manages to secure a meal for himself pretty much every day. Mm-hmm. So you can tell he's very clever in that aspect. And um, another thing about him, though, is that he is one of the Disney heroes that is very ambiguous. Like, he is portrayed as the hero, but for a lot of what he is, he's not very heroic. Um, I mean, when when he goes out and finds this girl of his dreams, you know, he simultaneously thinks, oh, she looks beautiful and I love her, and then he's thinking about the fortune that he's going to get from her father. 
Yeah, because he at one point he even addresses that. He's like, oh, right, her father's in the picture, too. Well, you know, he can't take his riches with him, and then when he kicks a bucket, I'll inherit them. He's like, wow, you're a greedy son of a bitch, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, he isn't portrayed as the most ambivalent of heroes, but he is portrayed as very intelligent, very effective in his, his methods, very graceful. And in fact, you know, there, there's a person, his rival in the town, who is pretty much the equivalent of Gaston, <laughs> and yet he's not as well liked as Ichabod is, because Ichabod is just that much better at socializing with people. He 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 doesn't pay this guy any attention. He's just like, oh, you know, you can be, you can do whatever you want, but I'm still going to get the upper hand. He has this confidence about him that really puts him in the hero role. Mhm. Yeah, that leads to our the other character, which is Bron Bones. Like like you said, he is pretty much a Gaston figure. You know, he's very strong, very confident, muscular, and he's also kind of a bully. But as they say, you know, a lot of the jokes he plays are usually in good fun. However, he is intimidating enough when he does scare off whatever guy happens to get in his path, particularly when they hit on his girlfriend. And the the thing is, as, as much as Brahm is portrayed as a villain, I don't think he is very villainous. Now... To look at it from this perspective. Brahm is he he is a Gaston figure, and in those time in those days it was very considered very heroic or very masculine to be this buff guy who can lift many things. You're strong. You're able to do your work, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of the way he was, you know, born. This is kind of like a southern small village. Think of it that way. And so he's just out for, you know, to do a couple different things. He's out to have a wife and have a family and just be admired by the townspeople. And for the most part, when we first see him, he is admired by people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because even though they do show him kind of, you know, sneaking up on people, you know, scaring him off, scaring him a bit, he does, you know, share his, his wealth and his resources with the town. You know, he tries, you know be friendly with everyone but and so he, he he isn't portrayed as like a brute or anything he isn't portrayed as stupid in, in fact he isn't very stupid mm -mm. Like, it's, it's just that he's kind of flustered when ichabod comes waltzing into town because you know he he waltzes in with his superior intelligence and his book learning and his his just really uncanny ability to have everyone um everything he wants happen you know mm -hmm. every, every, everything ichabod wants to do happens you know mm -hmm. and actually brahm from what we see doesn't really take issue with him you know the only thing he seems to you know the most he seems to do is pretty much just you know uh have a little fun with him because again like i said ichabod is a very strange looking person you know, the type of person that you kind of can't can't help but poke fun at. And, of course, you know he's a bookworm, and you know how bookworms were treated back in those days. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't do anything, like, horrible to him, you know, just aside from the occasional prank. It's not until he starts hitting on his girlfriend that he actually starts to get mean. Yeah, well, I, I don't know if it's actually his girlfriend. I mean, the, this girl walks into town, and, you know, she has a wealthy father, and... Everyone in town, all the guys, are swooning after her. So I'm not sure if it's Brahm's girlfriend or not, but basically he wants to win the, the heart of the most beautiful girl, and he, he figures he can do it. And then Ichabod c cuts in, and he keeps doing everything in his power to just shut Brahm down. Well, I think because... I think a big problem with that is the girlfriend herself. Her name is Katrina. And like you said, she's, you know, the popular, beautiful, rich girl of the town that all the guys want to get with. And the problem is she's also a flirt and kind of a slut. You know, where she kind of just 
you know, she loves the attention of all the men, and she loves the fact that, you know, they go out of their way to do favors for her. That way she doesn't have to do anything herself. And I think uh, I, I think she is supposed to be Brom's girlfriend, but she, I think she doesn't want to, like, commit to him because that means that the guys won't be around there to do her bidding. <laughs> so, Because that's the big thing that attracts her to uh, Ichabod is the fact that he's not afraid of Brom. And will, you know, c- kind of, you know, push him out of the way and, like, go for her himself. You know, while Brom just trails behind, you know, glaring at him angrily. So, I-, I think, I think like, they are supposed, both Brom and Katrina are supposed to be a, a couple. But while he kind of takes, you know, his commitment seriously, she obviously doesn't. Mm-hmm. She, she's a very fickle person. Mm-hmm. Um... But overall, I don't paint Brom Bones as a villain. The story itself does, though, especially towards the end. Um, Basically, throughout the entire cartoon, um, Brom is trying to get Katrina to to marry him. He wants to have her as his girlfriend, but Ichabod keeps shutting him down. And so, in order to gain her affections, he he has to scare Ichabod away. And so he tells this very big ghost story about this headless horseman who is supposed to come out at midnight and you know he he takes some he'll take your head and he wants to reattach it on his own head because he's headless and so Ichabod being a superstitious sort of man completely believes this tale and is you know he he when he's riding home from this party that Katrina has put on he he's you know he gets increasingly paranoid and at first it seems like oh yeah the headless horseman is just a hoax and then he shows up at the end at the climax and it's very unclear whether or not Brom is the one dressing up as the headless horseman or it's the headless horseman actually appearing but in the original tale it was Brom who dressed up as the headless horseman in order to scare away Ichabod. Yeah, that's what I sort of believe, too. Especially since he and the horseman kind of have the same horse. You know, the same black horse with red eyes. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you said, it's made a little more ambiguous, especially since at one point Ichabod actually does get up close to the headless horseman himself and stares down his neck hole, and there's, like, nothing there except for, like, a really creepy laugh. Yeah, I mean, you know, Ichabod maybe he he could have been he could have done something to to disguise his face or something. I don't know. I it's really hard to say with that. It's such an ambiguous story, and it doesn't even tell us whether Ichabod survives or not. It just in the actual cartoon, it's just like, oh, well, some people believe that he was killed that night and taken down with the headless horseman. Or some people say that he's still alive and living in a different county, and so in for the Disney debate kill for the Disney kill count in that regard, we can only add point five because it's so damn ambiguous. Exactly, because there there are so many different things that could have happened that night. Like, let's say for instance that okay, that was Brom Bones who was the horseman. So basically, you're saying that. He threw the pumpkin head, knocked out Ichabod, killed him and his horse, and then buried them both somewhere where their bodies were never found. Uh, that makes Brahm a murderer, and thus, you know, a qualified villain. Mm-hmm. Or, or, uh... Or he just scared Ichabod away, as yeah, dressed as the head. Lesser, a lesser, less grisly ending is that he knocked him out, dragged him to some outskirts of town, and then Ichabod so fearful of the Headless Horseman returning, just up and left town and never returned. That's another thing. And then you have the possibility that, yes, it actually was the Headless Horseman, and he actually did drag him down to hell. The question is, how did he do it? Because according to the story, the Headless Horseman only exists on a certain patch of road, and he can't go past this one portion where, where there's a bridge. But even though... Ichabod gets past the bridge, he stupidly stops and turns around to look back at him, 
and gets hit in the face with a flaming pumpkin. Mm-hmm. I guess I guess you could say that the pumpkin was still able to materialize past that point, and then it dragged him down to hell or something. But... Or there's the fourth option where it was the headless horseman, but he just chased Ichabod away, and he didn't actually get him. Right. And so, like, kind of, obviously, the pumpkin had to have hit him because its remains were still there. Mm-hmm. So I guess, I guess he just knocked him out, and then Ichabod woke up at some point, and then just took off. There's so many different endings this story could possibly have in the context of the narrative, and yes, in the original tale, Ichabod did die. Yeah. You know, it, it was a lot less ambiguous. But here, because this is a Disney adaptation, it's really hard to say. So, like we said, 0.5 to the kill count, so we are now up to 8.5. Yeah, but I I actually like the fact that they left it ambiguous, because, you know, you pretty much leave it up to your own imagination to figure out what happened that day. And a lot, like they said, the people of Sleepy Hollow find it much more fun to believe that he actually was taken away by the the, uh, headless horse. You know, that adds and the mysticism of it. Especially because this is, like I said, this is a southern small town. They, they they would be the people to either laugh it off as foolishness or just, you know, have fun with the legend. Mm-hmm. They wouldn't be, they, they're much different from the intellectual Ichabod. Mm-hmm. And actually, if you think about it, you could, techni- you could actually count this as the first Disney Halloween special. Since it's That's like, true. It's, That's, it's like very true. Night. So... So cool! This is the first Halloween Disney Halloween show, and the be- and one of the best in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it, it, this is there are a lot of firsts in this movie. First of all, the first animated packaged film that actually really works together. We have the first Disney villain song, which we're gonna get to in a, just a few minutes when we talk about the music for the film, and we also have the first real. Yeah, no, it, it's not the first Disney villain because you know Snow White and stuff. But um, you definitely have the uh, first really scary villain. Mm-hmm. The, the first threatening villain, like Snow White, the Queen had presence. The 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 Queen was, you know, when she transformed into the old hag, she had presence and stuff like that. But I never really believed she was a threat because what did she really actually do herself? She poisoned an apple, and she she made Snow White fall asleep, but she didn't kill her. Right. I mean, the the the, the Wicked Queen or Old Hag is scary in the sense that you know she's so shockingly ugly that it's scary, you know, to look at. But the Headless Horseman is like scary, as in you know you can picture a demon out of hell looking like this. Mm-hmm. And for those of you wondering out there, yes, we have a Disney villain kill count as well. The 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 Snow White Queen is the first victim, and so far the only victim of Disney villain deaths. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they've been rather kind to the villains so far. They haven't been kind to Bambi's mom. Bambi's mom! Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish they'd been less kind to the people from So Dear to My Heart. I wanted to strangle every single one of them. <laughs> yeah, especially to the villains in Pinocchio. Because seriously, each and every one of them deserves some sort of come up and <laughs> I'm you, Pinocchio. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those are the really the characters of it, uh, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow. I mean, it's really a very small cast mm-hmm. and every single one of them is played by Bing Crosby who does an amazing job although it is kind of weird to hear his voice coming out of every single character yeah the, that kind of adds to my belief that just that you really shouldn't make singers into voice actors cuz true while it does work well for you know the musical numbers and all that the the thing is, you have to get a person with a with a good range, just so even though you know it's obviously the narrator, you know, talk, like doing the voice of the characters, they 
it's at least different enough where you can distinguish between characters. In which case, in this case, all three, the narrator, Ichabod, and Brom, sound exactly the same. And you can obviously tell it's being crossed. Mm-hmm. And it just, it doesn't work. Like, I know the song you're, we're about to talk about is a pretty good song, but it just sounds weird, in my opinion, coming out of Brom. Because you expect some guy who's like, you know, all big and strong and and all that, you know, to have a way different voice than, some, than someone who's like a smooth ladies man, like Bing Crosby. Mm. So let's talk about the music for a bit. Um, the Wind in the Willows doesn't really have a lot of the traditional Disney music numbers. And in fact, it's told pretty straight where there's some background music maybe, but that's about it. There is one song, and it's actually the first time you see Mr. Toad outside of the illustrations, and it's when he's riding on his uh, his cart with Cyril. Mm-hmm. And I think the song is called Merrily on Our Way. And it actually is a rather fun song. I mean, I actually do remember it fondly uh, in, the, uh, in those uh, sing-along songs that I used to watch when I was a kid. And it is pretty. It is pretty catchy, and it does, you know, pretty much sum up the character of uh, of Mister Toad perfectly. Yeah, but for for the most part, Wind in the Willows isn't really. It, it's not a musical revelation for Disney. Like it isn't something like Bambi, where even the background music is part of the story. It's it's not very. I, I wouldn't say it's it's. I wouldn't say it's not noteworthy, but it takes a backseat to the character himself. I agree. And, but actually, I think had the story of Mr. Toad actually been made into the full length Wind in the Willows, I'm pretty sure we would have seen a lot more songs that were probably like made a lot better. You know, had this been its own movie, but, you know, again, we just have the one song. And personally, I think the song, you know, does it enough for, for the introduction of the character. I mean, that's, mm. just, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it does its job as a character song. I just don't think the Wind in the Willows in this part of the film is more... It, it's not as much about music as The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow, on the other hand, there's it's completely told through um, musical pieces, whether it be from Bing Crosby himself, um or just like really well done background tones, um, you know. We 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 get to see Ichabod singing in that you know traditional Bing Crosby, ba boop ba boop ba boop, ba, you know, <laughs> singing tones, and it's very good. I have to I have to say this. It's very well told. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, de- de- definitely like someone like Ichabod needed you know a trait that made him attractive to the women. And, of course, you know, a guy who can sing is one of the sexiest things out there. So they, I am kind of sort of glad they gave him that one trait just to make, you know, have it make sense that all the women, women would be, you know, like pining over him as they do. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know, Bing Crosby, he's a good singer. There's no doubt about it. He's an amazing singer. And it is nice to, you know, hear him sing again in this, you know, especially during the, the song that Brahm sings. Where even though uh, even though it is kind of a bit too smooth, like a you know for the for the creepiness that they're going for, it it is it does sort of it does convey its message. You know, I, I thought it was very memorable. Um, like I said, this is one of Disney's. Like I said, this is the first Disney villain song that you know was ever created, and it works like it, it's a beat which is a little bit off putting but honestly it really works it's catchy and during the whole scene there's a really good animated sequence where he's like he's telling the story and he's showcasing what's going on and he like he throws a pumpkin into the fire and everything bursts up in flames and it just it has this energy to it that i found really fun mhm i'm actually you know, surprised that it didn't get a uh, a reboot you know, nowadays. But I think if they had a uh, one of the modern day, you know, male singers, not pop singers, mind you, you know, someone who's like it, who sings like smooth jazz or like 
old time classic stuff to sing it. It it could be like a really good memorable song. Mm-hmm. Some stars made into something a little creepy, sort of like what Marilyn Manson did with uh, this is Halloween. Oh yeah, Marilyn Manson did a great job with that song. Um, yeah, imagine if he did a version of a of a Brahm song about the Hell of Horsemen. I think it would be really, really cool. Mm-hmm. And honestly, the song itself does its job. Like it, it's basically meant, as we see with every Disney villain song, it's meant to showcase what the villain is all about. And each villain song is a bit different, but this one is does its job. It says, okay, this is the headless horseman. This is what he does. This is why he is the way he is. You know, he he his head got chopped off, so he searches for another one. Mm-hmm. Everything is told in the song, and it, it its purpose is very clear. Like, Brom wants to scare Ichabod away, and he tells this wild story, and it... It all really works together to create a good package. Definitely, like I said, it the music sometimes does get distracting. Cause, you know, it's obviously just Bing Crosby. You know, being Bing Crosby and singing the way he does. But then there are times where it does, you know, make sense and it does add a tone to the film. So I, I well, 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 not completely necessary. Necessary half the time, it is a nice addition. To, uh, the score of the film. I think if they updated it with a different person, or if they did like the entire songs with like, if they had like different artists doing each song, it would have been a little bit better. But honestly, this is still a very good cartoon, and overall, I'd say this this film is leagues better than anything we've we've touched on in terms of packaged films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and. Of course, this is going to be the last one that we'll touch on for a very long time, or at least one done in this format. So I'm just glad that they ended this on a high note, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we went from we we went from like the good stuff. We went from Fantasia to something boring to the Three Capieros, which, while nonsensical, was still fun. We went to Make My Music, which. You know, it it was okay, but disjointed. Fun and Fancy Free was just weird. <laughs> and Melody Time worked better than Make My Music. It was like a better version of Make My Music, but just altogether, it didn't flow that well. Right. And so where we end with this last one, it's like, it, it does a really good job of meshing two completely different stories with completely different formats, and I think it really works. It succeeds at everything it tries to do, and I'd say this is definitely a Disney classic. Mm-hmm. It's not it, it's not excellent, but it's very very good, and it's I highly recommend watching this one. Same same for me, definitely, especially around Halloween. Like, you can't have a Halloween without the story of the Headless Horseman. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those films where I would say everyone has to watch it, whether or not you like it, and I'm pretty sure you will enjoy both of these stories. But, you know, everyone should at least watch this film. More than anything else we've talked about in terms of package films, um excluding Fantasia, of course. You know, Fantasia I put on a much higher pedestal. But, you know, other with the other package films, there are some that are worth watching, but this is, you know, you have to watch it. This is a classic, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of makes me sad now that we have no more of these to review. It doesn't make me sad. <laughs> but they should have been better. I, uh, is it possible? I, <laughs> well, at least they aren't as bad as So Dear to My Heart or So Help Me the Reluctant Dragon. <laughs> Wait, strike that, reverse it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like we said, this is the last package film, so from here on out, um, we move on to the 50s, and it's pretty much just a single-story narrative from this point on. And yeah. we start it with the best feature-length narrative in a Rather long time, actually, which is Cinderella. Yay! Yay. And I, I want to go on record saying I love 
Cinderella. And I know that's a stereotypical girlish thing to say, but I do. <laughs> I mean, this this one film, Cinderella, saved Disney Studios. And if it wasn't for Cinderella's success, they would have still been making bears slapping each other into animated features. <laughs> True. <laughs> And uh, for those of you wondering, not only are we, uh, are we going to be talking about Cinderella, but we're also going to be talking about its sequels as well. Mm -hmm. oh. But next week, before we even touch upon Cinderella and uh, Cinderella 2, Electric Boogaloo, <laughs> and um, the third film, which I have yet to see, um, before that, we are going to launch into the first retrospective, and that's something we're going to do after every single decade. We're going to talk about each film in the decade in six, you know, in succession, and then once we finish that, we're going to give you know our best, worst. We're going to do. I, I'd, I'd say we could do a top three and a bottom three, mm -hmm. and then honorable mentions maybe. And, you know, give our overall impressions of the decade. We're also going to give um, our Disney villain kill count. We're going to give the official kill count up until that point. The the Disney death count um, up until that point, And anything else we have to say about that particular decade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you'll... And, of course, you're all free to participate as well, like... Like we mentioned before, we're going to be putting up a poll in the in the Facebook group, uh, listing all the movies that we have talked about, uh, excluding Snow White, of course, just because a it's in the 30 technically in the 30s, and b I mean come on Snow White, of course it's good. <laughs> so it's going to be from Pinocchio all the way to Ichabod and Mr. Toad, and mm -hmm. you're free to vote multiple times if you'd like to, um, and we'll in addition to my personal best and worst, and Dave's personal best and worst. We're also going to talk about your personal best and worst and see how how they all match up and what you all. And if, again, if you have any you know comments, like any specific things you want to say, like why you like this particular film or why you hate this particular film, you know, feel free to leave it, and we'll try to see if we can work it into the uh, the debate. You know, where we where we talk we talk about you know everything that's good and bad and whether we think you're right and we're wrong, or vice versa. <laughs> and then again, it is all opinion, of course, but you know, we, we want to get audience participation in there. We want to see what you guys think out there. Even though we're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway, this has been the Disney debate for today. We've just, just touched on the last film of the 40s, kids. Mm -hmm. So next time we're on to the retrospective. But for now, um, if you have any comments, criticism, suggestions, or Disney movie suggestions that may not fall into Disney canon or something like that, please let us know at zenithrule.blip.tv or follow us on twitter.com slash zenithrule and twitter.com slash cat, uh, twitter.com slash Rabbit. Um, you can follow us and, you know, message us, you know, say what Disney films are your best or worst. Or, if you don't want to do that, you can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash zenithrule and facebook.com slash catmac. And, you know, friend us, you know, chat with us, tell us what you think of our podcast and what you think of the films that we're viewing. Um, anyway, I'm Zenith Rule. And I'm Cat Mac slash FMT Rabbit slash Cat C Critic. And we will see you guys next time for the retrospective. CCFN, that's all for now. Thank you for watching the Media Meltdown. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more awesome videos. And if you like what you see, show your support on the Patreon page at patreon.com slash media meltdown. See you all next time on Dragon Book. I mean, the Media Meltdown.